Hello and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And myself, Stephen George. Good evening. Good evening. It's Sunday, the 4th of September, 2016. And we have a packed show tonight. Loads of information. And we have two guests on the show tonight. Our first guest will be a lady called Dr. Diane Cochran. We're going to be talking about near-death experiences. And our second guest at the end of the show, just for a few minutes, we hope to have Stephen Manning on from Integrity Ireland. Stephen was out today uh, with uh, a few people from Integrity Ireland. Ireland, um, involved in the protest at Judge Seamus Hughes' house. You'll probably remember that um, this is the same Judge Joan Wayne and um, were outside the actual courthouse chatting to each other and the guard came out and actually arrested them under the judge's orders for um, contempt of court. I've n- you've never heard that before. Um, they're outside chatting contempt of court. So they got sent down for seven uh, seven days apparently, but uh, Ben Gilroy went in and got them out under habeas corpus and they went in for two days. This is the same judge, by the way, that got his points written off and also I believe his wife had points written off as well. So um, one rule for us, another rule for them. So all the integrity people went down and paid a visit to his house today to say hello to him, you know. Um, and he actually had two articles uh, Arctic trucks parked outside his house so the protesters couldn't get near the house but um, that didn't work apparently but we'll find out more from Stephen anyway because um, we're going to have to um, stop this corruption and this cronyism in Ireland it's just getting beyond the joke now at the moment and Integrity Ireland are doing a fantastic job but before we get into talking about the bits and pieces that happened during the week we're going to find out about communication channels and the extra bits as well Okay, communication channels this evening are as follow. The communication channels are email info at oymireland.com by phone 046-927-1212 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Yes, 046, <coughs> excuse me, 046, sorry, the phone number is 046-927-1212. Uh, if you want to ring in, uh, ring in and ask questions uh, to our guest this evening, if you want to ring in from outside the Republic of Ireland, the number will be zero zero three five three four six nine two seven one two one two. And this is the first for OAM. If you want to text, if you can actually text us in now, the number for texts only is zero eight seven. Four zero three four eight five four. I'll read that again. Uh, t- again, it's for text only. It's zero eight seven. If you're obviously if you're going to text in from outside or from Ireland, it's going to be zero zero three five three eight seven four zero three four eight five four. One more time, just in case you didn't have a pen handy. O eight seven four zero three four eight five four. That's the new text number. Uh, so text only. Uh, we also have the website that is oymradio.com. From the website, you can link to the the social media, the the Facebook, the anti-social media, the Twitter, Skype, and you can also send us in emails. You can check out the chat room. Uh, you can also there's lots plethora of information on there as well uh, for your viewing pleasure. We also monitor people's internet radio chat room as well. So we're going to monitor both of the chat rooms for your questions this evening Alan brilliant can I just say that the the text number is on the front page of the website you can find the number there if you pop off to the front page of the website the text number is there and the text will only be available on the live show when the live show is over the the actual uh, phone will be switched off and won't be switched on again till next week so please don't be sending text outside the hours of the live show because it won't be switched on it's purely for the live show only at this moment in time Thank you very much. Right, Steve's going to kick us off. Yes, I've got me kicking boots on. Uh, we we have to laugh at the moment, uh, that is, of the fear porn, about the end of the world on YouTube. Uh, so many people wanting clicks, uh, so they put up these end of the world in inverted commas titles, uh, which turn out to be recycled articles and video from many, many years ago. However, you need to keep an eye on what is going on as things are changing on a daily basis. Just That's in relation to... Alan was watching the video and he sent me a link to a video during the week where someone had information that the war was, was going to end on the 4th of September 2016. But when you actually click into the link, you realise that it's a very old article. Um, I think it was something that was on Russia Today a couple of years back. Um, and like, there's a lot of people doing that. And all the, the, the sole purpose that they're doing it is to get clicks on the YouTube channel because obviously the more clicks they get, maybe they're getting... Uh, 
I don't know, cent, a couple of cents per click. Who knows? But again, just just be be mindful of that and you know use the same when watching these videos. Exactly, it's a uh, clickbait. That's all it is, clickbait. And the there is a couple of channels that do the same thing over and over again just to get clicks. So just be wary of it. Anyway, um, the other good thing we have good news for you now. At the end of the show, we're going to be telling you where you can purchase hemp juice with CBD in it. Um, it does not have the THC. It's purely CBD, which is the stuff that you want. And the company is in, in Ireland. You can go to the website. You can order it online, and it'll be delivered direct to your house at a reasonable, reason, reasonable uh, price as well. Um, now, I think that's a, a pretty, uh, a pretty great deal. Now, I spoke to the people who are running the website, and and we'll fill you in on the details. But basically, um, there are any pe- the, the, there are a couple that run the website, run the business, and they're the only couple in Ireland that actually have a license to produce um, hemp. And it's industrial hemp, hence why it's full of CBD and no THC. So, and to add to uh, that, they actually sent us a sample of the actual uh, product. And now, I've taken it the last two days. I took, they're in an ice cube format, and I took some two ice cubes on Friday and two ice cubes on Saturday, yesterday. And, well, let's just say, it's, it is kind of an acquired taste. I mean, I did use orange juice. Now, Steve is wimp, going to... Wimp! Steve is going to say, yeah, wimp, and he's going to wimp out. But you have to understand, if I got a pair of old Wellingtons, and I put them in a pan, and I boiled them up, and I poured it into a glass, Steve will say, that tastes great. <laughs> no, as I said to you, if somebody told me and proved the benefits of these boiled-up wellies, then <laughs> I, I, my, my, my kind of thoughts are... Well, it's only on your taste buds for a couple of seconds, and that's it. it the taste is gone. It's gone inside into your body, where it can be, you know, in, uh, be di- distributed out to all the little organs where it needs to be, and it'll do good. But you know, yeah, you're, you're right in, in relation to the hemp juice. It it's a, it's an interesting taste. It's it, very. It is. But I've been taking it, and I just I just uh, put it in a glass of water, and let it dissolve, and then down the hatch. Yeah, no, it's 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 good stuff. It's um it's a food, by the way. It's not a medicine. Just to l- clarify that, and uh, somebody in the chat room said, "What is CBD?" Look up endocannabinoids. Did I say that right? Endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids. That's it. Look that up. Um, Don't ask us to spell it because we can't. No, the natural to your body, and it's uh, it balances your body. And if you're out of balance, then obviously you need them to be rebalanced. And CBD does this. But we will, what we're going to do is, the lady who runs the business, we're going to have her on the show in a couple of weeks' time. She agreed, she has, has agreed to come on the show, or her partner has agreed to come on the show, to talk about it. So that's a, a, a plus point. So we'll give you the details at the end of the show, we'll talk about it. Steve, over to you. Yeah, a report in KildareNow.com. Uh, this is a dec- uh, Direct Democracy Ireland's Damien O'Kelly, who's living in Enfield in County Meath. Uh, seemingly, he has sourced his car insurance from Zurich in Germany, uh, as Irish prices are forcing motorists off the road and out of business. It said, uh, "That's quite interesting because we did actually talk about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we may have not, we may not have said it on the live show, but we definitely discussed it among ourselves about trying to source insurance." Uh, from other European countries because at this moment in time we are all still under the European Union umbrella you know so I mean it, with all the trade that goes on surely we should be able to uh, source insurance but obviously well thanks to Damien O'Kelly he's now he's obviously living proof that it can be done so we'll probably see if if it's possible to get in contact with Damien O'Kelly and uh, just see exactly what he's done and maybe give her, give a report at some some point in time Brilliant how's your week Steve? Yeah, my week's been fine. Not much to report, I have to say. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. And as you know, uh, I, I generally, as people know, I plant seeds in the minds of people and work. And I have to say, over the past couple of months, some of the seeds are starting to blossom and bloom and grow. And people are starting to ask questions about the government and what's going on in this country. Especially, as we've seen this week with the, the big uh, fiasco with Apple. I mean, that's kind of that has everybody's talking about that. So uh, yeah, that that can't go uh, on. It can't go ignored. I mean, ugh, it can't be ignored. Sorry. Um, the only other thing on my list is uh, Hillary Clinton. We did mention here a couple of weeks ago on the show, and we were told that Hillary would probably not be mm, the new president of the USA. I kind of thought she would be, but seemingly her health is deteriorating, and 
you know, this was kind of speculated upon. But in a recent um, report in one of the American uh, newspapers, I think, I think it was a newspaper anyway, uh, seemingly Bill Clinton has expressed his concern over Hillary's health and she seemingly had some tests done and she's she's not in the greatest of health but seemingly the doctors can't actually nail it down they can't pin down exactly what's going on uh, but again we were told that you know people of her kind of profile they they were going to be getting sick and uh, well it looks like uh, hillary is succumbing to that anyway uh, so just we it'll be interesting to see exactly what happens because you know because I know, we all know she's on the campaign trail now between herself and and uh, DT, Donald Trump, so uh, it'll be quite interesting to see what happens if she does make it to the White House or if she has to back away due to medical conditions or medical concerns. That's it. That's There you, there you go, short and sweet. How was your week? Okay, just before we get Dr. Diane on, uh, just a couple of things. I met up with ex um, South Yorkshire Police Intelligence Analyst Tony Farrell for our coffee during the week. And we, we're going to try and do a show with Tony and Ja in a few weeks' time regarding the Hillsborough disaster, which happened in 1989, which claimed 96 lives. The information that they have now is going to rattle a few cages and expose a few people. So that's going to be interesting. I had a chat with them, and uh, yeah, very interesting information. Now, we also know there's an awful lot of... Um, we're being inundated with requests for interviews, which is a great sign for OIM that loads of people want to come on the show and actually do an interview and talk about things. And uh, we are, but we are inundated, and we're trying to fit everybody in as much as we can. Um, so we, everybody just has to be patient, unfortunately, because we only do one show a week, and it takes uh, a lot of work, even just doing the one show, getting things organised. Um, and also, uh, we have, when people send us an email and say, can you email this person on uh, and ask them if they'll come on the show and talk, we do do that. We do follow up on emails, but some people don't email back and they don't contact us back, so there's not much we can do about that, so apologies for that, but what you know, that's just the way it works. Anyway, right, we're going to get um, our guest on now. It's, uh, our guest is Dr. Diane Cochran. We're going to be talking about near-death experiences. Before we get Diane on, Steve's going to give us a quick bio of uh, Diane's uh, background. Yeah, the, uh, Dr. Diane Cochran was born in Rochester, New York, and joined the Army Nurse Corps after completing nursing school in Rochester. She served in the Army Nurse Corps for 25 years, uh, starting in Vietnam and ending as the Chief Administrator in Frankfurt Army Medical Center during Desert Storm. During the 25 years she served in the military, uh, she held a variety of positions from staff nurse, director of education, nursing supervisor to commander of the 80th CSH. Uh, during her time in the service, she also completed an MA and PhD. After retiring from the military, she was the director for medical services for a techn technology company that specialised in documentation of injuries during combat and transporting medical records <coughs> on a smart card. She also worked for several healthcare consulting companies that work with the Department of Defence. I could go on. The, 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 the bio that we have here for Diane, and this is a, a short bio, it's two pages long. So well, it could be, like, we could be reading it for the next ten minutes. So I think the best thing to do is just go straight to the lady herself. Brilliant stuff. Good evening, Dr. Diane. How are you doing? Good evening. I'm doing great, thanks. Brilliant stuff. Thanks a lot for coming on. This is a subject that um, a lot of people have spoke to me about when we told them that you're going to be coming on the show. They start asking questions straight away. And I said, well, I can't answer these questions because we haven't done the interview yet. So there's obviously a lot of interest in this subject. So before we get into it, is there anything you want to add to your bio or anything that you want to start off with? Or is there any kind of things that people need to know before we get stuck into the subject? Well, no, only that I actually got involved or interested in near-death experiences from a patient in Vietnam. And, of course, nobody had written anything about it by then, so um, I kind of tucked it in the back of my head and listened and paid attention. So here I am 40 years later, still involved, president of the International Association, and still think it's important for doctors and nurses to understand um, things about near-death experiences and support patients. Excellent. And obviously, you're doing, you've done a hell of a lot of work in this subject matter. So we, I'd like to think, based on what I read on your bio, that you're probably one of the best people to speak to about it. Can you tell us um, 
what your experiences are and what you've come across in the years that you've been doing it um, are there certain common denominators which you've come across with people well there aren't any common denominators about who has NDEs um, they go across all areas of education of money of cultural everybody has them even atheists agnostics people uh, religions who don't believe in an afterlife so we don't really know why some people have them and others don't. There are common characteristics of NDEs that are universal. So no matter where you were from, Egypt or Iceland or wherever, there are some characteristics, about 15, that are universal for NDEs. And you might have one or five or very few people have all 15. Um, so we do know that, that there are common characteristics and common after effects. Okay, and what are these characteristics that people are seeing? Because we all know the classic, seeing the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, or people that had, uh, had an operation and they died on the operating table, and they see themselves, they're floating above the table, and they can actually tell the doctors what was going on, and the doctors are just amazed, because they said, well, when, when that was happening, you were dead, technically dead. So are there any um, common characteristics? So what, are you, what have you been told by the people? What are they saying? Well, those are certainly two, uh, perceiving things from outside your body, a sense of movement through darkness or a tunnel, intense emotions, um, experiencing a great light, um, experiencing or perceiving a spiritual realm, um, which may include really memorable landscapes that have colors that we don't have that exist here. Um, I think uh, spiritual beings, meeting with spiritual beings or religious figures, knowledge, uh, kind of universal knowledge in that place you know everything or can know everything. Um, a sense of oneness and connectedness to nature, to everything else. Um having a sense of knowledge about the future, uh, messages regarding life purposes. The thing that he, it was most impressive to me early on was the encounters with deceased loved ones. Mm. And this was particularly interesting with children because children just tell you whatever happened to them. You know, they, they, they're not reading articles on it and way back when. They just say, I died, I went to heaven, I saw my grandfather, who they didn't ever meet. And uh, the grandfather might have lived in Europe or someplace other than the child lived. So those are some of the um, characteristics of an NDE. But it's pretty impressive when people come back and tell you about deceased loved ones' lives or death, how they died when nobody else actually knew this information. Okay. Now, obviously, if you look at the scientific community and, the, and very certain doctors, they'll say that it's all a kind of chemical imbalance when you die and it actually doesn't happen. And it's all got to do with the body and the brain and, you know, that it's, that's all kind of um, new age mumbo jumbo. What's your take on that? Well, now we know we have some research. We know it's not due to lack of oxygen. There's been some very good research in Europe with a Dr. Pin von Lommel, um, who studied cardiac patients, and they looked at drugs and oxygen and other kinds of criteria that could affect it. And we know that that's not true, because now there are people who are clinically dead who have these experiences, so we know that the experience actually can work outside of the brain when the brain's not involved in this. And so there's a lot of work um, on that aspect of it now in consciousness. Okay, because I've heard a few stories regarding people having certain experiences. So we'll go through the stories because I'm sure people will be asking these questions anyway. Does people, as you said, that when they have the near-death experience, uh, I've heard people saying that, um, a family member or somebody who's spiritual, I don't know who that would be, would say to them that they have to go back, it's not their time. Have you come across that? 
Yes, usually what happens is either their uh, a relative tells them this that it's not their time to stay, or a superior religious figure, and they may tr- because most people they ha- they encounter this light and love apparently that is so just wonderful they don't want to come back, mm. and th- then they they're told you have to go back and the next thing they know they end up in their physical body. Okay. Now that could affect people in different ways. Some people um I know will come back quite content saying I know what to expect when I die. Other people will come back depressed because they want to stay. Well I think the initial effect sometimes is Um, And I've seen this, and now I certainly understand it, that patients are angry because why did you resuscitate me when I was in this wonderful place? Because when you're outside of your physical body, there is no pain. So if people had a horrible accident or for some reason were in terrible pain and they come back to that body, they're not too excited about it right away. But usually that gets integrated in. We don't see a lot of uh, people who are really clinically depressed because of this. Um, hopefully if they get someone to talk to, if they get some information, now there's a lot of information available on the web uh, or in YouTube, they, they can see, okay, but it takes them a little while to integrate the experience into their life because it will change their life. The after effects change many people's lives, uh, and so they aren't always prepared for that, nor is their family. So it's important to work with the family also. And what, uh, what have they done? Have people come back and done any things extreme? Like I've heard cases of people leaving the, their friends and family and joining a monastery and, and, and going off and searching for you know themselves uh, in a kind of spiritual way. Have you come across that? Well, not quite that uh, severe, but we do hear a lot of people who may have had very materialistic jobs, on, you know, in the stock market or you know, something to do with that, and they become less materialistic and much more altruistic. So a lot of them will uh, seek different employment and uh, become a chaplain, something in healthcare fields or social work. They're all about helping other people and uh, not so interested in how much money they make. Yeah, well, the service to others is something that we are big on promoting here at OAM, and we talk about an awful lot, about service to others, and that's where we should be going. Now, I've come across a couple of situations and stories I've heard again, watched, uh, dramatized, but basically, nonetheless, this is people's own experience. And one of them was this chap who had a bit of a... Um, checkered past you could say and he was in the hospital and he was near his death um, and they knew that and he knew that and he starts seeing certain apparitions in the actual room just him um, which wasn't very nice uh, more on the negative side now I don't want to go down the actual movie ghost route where if you're a bad person these negative energies or entities come out of the of the ground but have you spoken to anybody that had an NDE that were told or experienced something negative or were told that if they didn't change their life that um, it wouldn't be a nice uh, end result for them? Well, first of all, usually experiences do not happen necessarily good experiences to good people and bad experiences to bad people. doesn't work that way. There are people who have more frightening experiences, but it's more about isolation. And I think what you're talking about is there is an aspect of the characteristic called the life review. Mm -hmm. In that life review, if you're not a very nice chap and you did a lot of things in your life like bully or hurt people, you're going to experience, the, it's like a panoramic television show. You're going to see all these experiences that you did in the past, but you will experience it from the other person's point of view. So you're going to feel their pain. You're going to feel, you know, what you did to them. So that is kind of a wake-up story for most people. 
And um, so th- from that perspective, uh, that's true. Most people that come and have NDEs do change their life a lot. And uh, it, it becomes a lot about service and helping others and and providing um, a love and contentment within themselves. And they go on to study spirituality or other kinds of things like that. So that's where um, people do change their lives, but it's not um, not quite so directly uh uh, drilled into them. Yeah. Well, obviously, we don't want to go down the um, the religious route too much, but it's something that we've heard as well regarding the review of your life, and that you review your own life. They don't review your life; you review your own life. And of course, we've talked about karma on the show. We've had people on, um, like Ralph Ring, who is an expert in natural law, and he said, "Of course, karma. It's a universal law. It's energy." You know, you put it, bad energy out, bad energy comes back. If you put good energy out, good energy comes back. It's science. Um, and it's all about the energy. Now, this kind of clarifies what you're saying with the kind of karma thing. Now, because this is an NDE and not somebody dying and, and staying permanently over on the spiritual realm, um, have they come back? Has anybody said to you that they went and they were being reviewed or they started to get reviewed and they had to come back? Did you have any, have any uh, records on that? The life review is a review that people do for themselves. It's not that anybody else is judging them, but they're judging their own behavior in this lifetime, and they frequently do change their behavior a great deal. Okay. The, uh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's a good thing. I mean, I have uh, my own personal experience, uh, well, knowledge of I know that my grandmother... When she was near her time, um, uh, my my mother said that um, she got up in the bed, sat up in the bed, and started waving at, at the end of the hospital bed to whoever we don't know. And my mother was looking, and there was nobody there, but she was waving to them. So she was obviously getting ready to to pass over the spiritual people who were there, obviously waiting for her to pass over. Is there any kind of strange experiences that you come across from people which seems to be out of the norm? Well, a lot of people do that. And uh, frequently it's somebody, a loved one that's already passed over. My own mother, um, when she was dying, she was looking up in the corner of the room and she called my father's name. Um, I hear this all the time and, in fact, I use it as a reference for people to say, um, tell them, go, go to whoever it is that's calling you because they're there to help you transition. And this doesn't have to be awful. It can be loving. You've got someone there that cares for you who will help you transition into the other world. All right, okay, that's, that's interesting. And as you say, this has not got to do with your religion or your belief system. So it's something bigger. Have you, all the information and the the, uh, the data that you've uh, collated over this time, what's your own take on it? What do you think is going on? Well, I um, we don't adhere to any specific religious beliefs. We think it doesn't have to do with religion. I I believe that there is a spiritual realm and um, this lifetime is we're in a body with a um, a spirit and a physical body, and we move into another realm that is um, purely spiritual. And it's certainly um, just kind of moving into another phase of your life. So I do think that happens, and um, we hear lots of stories from children from adults about what that life is like, things that happen there. And um, I think we could, uh, we've been very afraid of dying. And I think one of my jobs is to let people know this doesn't have to be awful. You're not going to be separated from everybody. You'll know what's happening. But you have somebody there who's there to help you transition and be part of your spiritual world 
Okay. And has anybody ever said that they actually met their spirit guide rather than a family member? Oh, sure. Yeah, a lot of times, um, sometimes they don't know who the person is, but they have different spiritual guides to help them, and that happens a lot. Okay, that's interesting. We have them, um, the questions are already starting to come in, so I'm going to pass you over to Steve. Steve's going to go through them. Steve? Yeah, I just want to say, um, when you were talking about, pe- about people passing over to the other side, having NDEs, <clears throat> and obviously even before they, they, they pass over, they can actually see spirits from the hospital bed. And um, we had a, a relation of my wife's, and he died. He died actually a year ago this week. And um, when my wife went up to see him, I think about a week before he passed, she did say that he he was he was he was kind of he he wasn't well. I think he had emphysema. He was in a very bad place. He was dying. But she went up to him, and he was in good form. One of the evenings, and he said to her. I was I was lying here last night, he said, and in the corner, just over there, and he pointed to the corner, and he said, "Me mother and and Nancy were there." Now that was Nancy was a sister who who passed away a year previously, and he said, uh, "You know, I I know I'm going, I know I'm going." He says, and uh, you know, I was worried, but when I seen them there last night, they reassured me everything is going to be all right, and I think a couple of days later, well, he died, but he he died kind of happy because he he. He said he had seen that. He had seen them appear before him and kind of reassure him. Is that something that would, would that happen often? Yes, it does happen often. And it's something that I teach people who are dying and who are going to die because sometimes they'll come back and forth and they'll go over and then come back. But we want to teach them that it doesn't have to be awful. It can be a loving transition There'll be people there to guide them. And um, because people are afraid they're going into a black hole or nowhere, and it isn't that way. And now we have thousands and thousands of people that um, can tell us about what it was like for them. And we're all going to die. So um, I think it's a great bit of information for all of us uh, that we could look forward to. And what about when people do pass over, whether whether it's permanently or as an NDE? Uh, a, a question from one of our listeners, Agent. And the Agent says that, in his opinion, demons occupy the space between the atoms. And he says, i.e. ghosts slash demons. And he said, sometimes demons like to appear as dead relatives. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we really don't have much experience with that. What we hear about are people who... Um, had uh, met somebody, some of their relatives gave them information that only they would know about. Um, it, it's uh, always been um, a, a favorite aspect for me because it's very helpful and reassuring for people, uh, who, certainly who die and come back, and and we can't help but believe that uh, when they die permanently, that also would happen. So I don't see, and we don't hear about demons and those kinds of things um, actually very much. Okay, and what about people, Diane, who who will come back? Again, it's a question from Gwyn. Uh, people who have an NDE and then they come back and they're able to speak a, a, a foreign language fluently that they, could, that they never knew before. Have you had experience with that? And if so, oh. what causes that? We, well, we don't know what causes it, but we have several cases of people coming back with skills like that. There's an orthopedic surgeon in upstate New York who was electrocuted. And when he came back, he he had no um, musical talents. He could play and write classical music. And um, he now he does shows and those kinds of things. We have people that can speak a foreign language. They often get information that uh, and come back and study information. I know uh, um, somebody by the name of Tom Sawyer who said he never read a book in his whole life. He was more on the athletic um, side of things. And when he came back, he was studying quantum physics and all this information he'd been given on the other side that now he was very interested in. And is there? Uh, do you have any, any kind of thoughts on what happens and, and how, how they come back 
from an MDE and have all these these uh, newfound skills? Well, I think the other side is a place where all knowledge exists and all things exist. And some of us, uh, when we go to the other side, are just given these gifts uh, for a reason. And we don't always know what that reason is. But how exactly it happens, I don't think we know. We just know that it does happen to an awful lot of people. And... Um, it's something that we want to support in them and know that it's you're not crazy. This is something that happens quite frequently. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, 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 it sounds to me like, uh, again, I don't know if this is something that you've researched, but we, we often, we've had guests on before and they spoke about the Akashic Records. And in the Akashic Records, it's supposed to be like your whole life story. And I'm wondering if people... If there was something that, that you were supposed to experience in life and you hadn't gone down that road yet, maybe maybe the NDE is 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 happens purposely to try and uh, give you this information or give you this knowledge or put you on the right path. Would, would that be plausible? I well, I think that's part of it. We certainly do hear that because um, people are frequently given um, maybe they've been lost and really didn't know the purpose of their life, and we'll hear about people who really honed in on what they were supposed to be doing. We do have people that remember seeing and going into a room with other spirit beings and reviewing the Kashuk records, their records, knowing what they were supposed to be doing and, and you know, what all those details are. So it obviously is part of and parcel to all of it. Okay. Moving on, uh, Dougie, uh, Dougie said, we had a guest, he can't remember the name, who said that when you die, you can choose to turn around and go back to your original soul origin and not come back to Earth into the human race. Is this the same for NDE? Well, um, many times we have people who choose to stay where they are and have tried to stay where they are, um, but the next thing they know, they end up. Um, back in their physical body. So it's not always our choice. Uh, sometimes, apparently, we have things that we haven't done yet or that we're still waiting to do. So I don't think it is always a choice of whether or not you want to come back. Okay. Um, where are we now? We have one from Graham. Graham says, question for Diane. Has Diane ever come across uh, an NDE where the person involved experiences a realm with negative entities no um i haven't ever talked to anybody um like that um i have they talk about a, a realm with different music different colors uh different people um and sometimes more frightening we don't call them negative but some people have a more frightening nde in that they're alone and they're not it's not it all is happy and all the relatives and stuff. They're more isolated. But we, even with that, uh, don't hear about this very often. Um, so it's not something, but I've not ever heard somebody tell me about a lot of negative entities. Yeah, that's that's kind of frightening now to think that when, if you did have an NDE, that, you know, we, you do hear people saying, oh, we have this light and it's all very loving um, and your relations there, but I mean, imagine kind of having an NDE yet where there's nothing and you're just kind of in a void of nothingness. Um, well, that would be frightening. I think, um, but a lot of people, I know of two people that had NDEs that were more lonely, but they integrated in a very positive way because they knew that for some purpose they had that. I think there's always the overwhelming sense that there is a purpose in all of this and our NDEs are part of that record part of that purpose uh, to help us see what we need to be doing um, and uh, to give us reassurance sometime and maybe better direction there's a few people that um, I'm aware of that really weren't very nice people and um, uh did have an NDE, and then they really turned their life around um, and became a more giving and service-oriented person. 
Well, that can't be too bad, really, can it? If somebody uh, does that. we I have heard an, a, a lady who had an experience where she was just a, a normal person, no kind of dodgy background, and she said that the NDE that she had was a very negative, scary experience, and that when it comes to the time that she does kind of move over, she was really, really hesitant and scared because she was frightened at what she's seen during her NDE. Have you have you come across that? Well, most of the people, um, as I said, I haven't heard um, very many of that. I know one person who had a more um, frightening NDE, and her name is Nancy Bush. She has a book out called Dancing with Death, I think. And is, you know, became a very uh, caring, loving person and has integrated her NDE. So she's not looking for another negative experience. Uh, people who have um, more than one NDE, and there are several people who do, um, don't always have the same experience. So um, I would not um, say that if someone had a more frightening one, they necessarily had to expect that when they actually died. Yeah, it could, could, it could be just a, a warning shot over the bell. You never know. Um, a way to kind of uh, wake them up and um, change their life, whatever they're doing. I don't know. I mean, we don't know. There's certain things we won't know until we cross over. As I always say, I know where I'm going. I just don't know how I'm going to get there. So, yeah. <laughs> which is uh, which is the best way to put it. Do you have more questions there, Steve? Oh, I do indeed. Okay. Yeah, we have a question from... Chris, uh, and Chris is wondering if we have spirit guides slash companions all our lives, is it possible that we also carry with us negative entities that feed off us for our whole life? And when we pass, can we see these beings? Um, I don't think um, everybody has spirit guides around them um, all the time, and you can ask uh, at night for them to be helpful to you if you need some direction or help in something. Um, and I don't think you, uh, the spirit guides would allow for negative entities to be around us. Um, uh, there are certainly negative entities in the world, but we protect ourselves by, um, covering ourselves with positive things and statements and asking our spirit guides for help. Um, but I don't think that we're going to meet a bunch of negative entities on the other side. Well, that's good. Has anybody ever said to you about seeing the light? In other way, you're told, go towards the light. Again, I know it's a kind of a bit of a cliche from the movie Ghost, but from a spiritual point of view, we've already heard, we, we've heard this from um, from people and obviously being spiritual ourselves and um, when you do spiritual rescue you normally get the spirit to walk towards the light is that uh, something that they have come back and reported seeing oh yeah we have a lot of people talk about the light and apparently it is so loving and so bright but not noxious that it it just people just want to stay in it it's the most magnificent feeling available Unfortunately, a lot of times with the movies, like in Ghosts, you know, that whole thing of negative entities, that doesn't really happen that way. And um, I think they're getting better about getting consultants about this um, because it really isn't the way it all works. So, um, you know, I think we ask for help. We ask for um uh, to spread love and service and ask our uh, spirit guides for direction. Okay. And have you had anybody that has said they have seen angels? Yes. We frequently hear that. We hear that from children and adults. Um, I hear that uh, periodically from people who are um, like just in the normal realm and were praying and praying and praying over something and an angel appeared. So it's not unusual to hear about that both in the NDE or just in um, normal life. Okay. Um, and what about people who, Diane, who, like, I mean, we've heard people and they said that they have seen, um, how would you say, 
I'm, I'm not going to say negative entities, but in in their in their waking moments, now not this again. This is not an NDE, but in their waking moments that they have actually seen um, figures yeah. in their rooms that they can't explain, and they just get a feeling that yeah. it's a negative a negative entity. Well, um, we certainly have issues where uh, people in this who we know are in the spiritual form um, come back to people, sometimes come back to see how they are or say hello. And and I always tell patients, you know, about that, that their relative might come back um, and not to be afraid of them. Um, I don't, I have heard of many cases where uh, someone comes back in the spiritual form and somebody either feels them, sees them, or just knows they're there. I have not heard a lot about um, negative uh, forms, feeling that there are negative negative forms in, in the area. I suspect that that's possible, but I personally haven't heard a lot about it. Yeah, I only ask because we do have someone who listens to us, um, and they have said uh, on several occasions that they do have these experiences where they can actually see beings when when they wake they will see these beings in their home and they have it it doesn't feel very pleasant so i'm guessing it's not a it's not a relation coming back to to let them know everything's okay on the far side they need to just ask them to leave you know um tell them that they're not welcome there they need to leave and that uh, and ask your guides to help you get rid of them. That's it. Well, I just did a, a spiritual clearance last Friday, uh, Diane, in a, a relative's house. Um, we had a negative spirit there in the house, which was unwelcome. So, funny you should say that. That's what I was doing last Friday. Um, now, two of the questions that I've come across uh, regarding NDEs, one of them is from a, a lady I know is a good friend of mine, and she thinks that when you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. And the other is the atheist who, atheist who doesn't believe, obviously, in any religion. Um, have you come across people who have that kind of attitude? Well, certainly we've come across those people. I can say that atheists who have near-death experiences usually aren't atheists anymore um, <laughs> okay. after Very the good. experience um, because it's more of a spiritual experience. People don't necessarily become more religious because they see that on the other side, it's very simple. You love more. You forgive more. There aren't all these rules and regulations. It's all about caring, helping um, in terms of their spiritual life. Um, People who think that it's just there you go and there's nothing more. It's just a big black hole. I can only say that that would be a very sad um, way to look at things. And I can tell you after you read a 100 near-death experiences and see again and again and again how this affects people that you hopefully would have a different view of that. Definitely. Well, this person, it would be interesting if I give her this interview after we do it tonight and she has a listen to it because I'm sure she would be interested um, to get your viewpoint and your experiences, your first-hand experiences, speaking to people that have NDEs because I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who will say, oh, look, you, when you're dead, you're dead. And to be honest with you, the, the New World Order or the Cabal want people to believe that, that there's nothing after you die. So, you know, enjoy yourself, be materialistic, screw everybody and get do as much damage as you can because you won't be coming back and there's nothing after you die. So do everything in this life. And I'm sure there's, there's a, a certain attitude of that um, where certain people promote that, not realising that there is uh, something after death and that chances are you're going to have to, um, there's going to be karma to pay back if you do, uh, if you have a certain bad life or treat people in a bad way. Well, and and that's actually what I've sort of taken as a philosophy now. When I see people who are just uh, mean-spirited and doing not very nice things, and um, we see some of that in our political story right now, and I think, oh, I wouldn't want to be them on the life review they're going to have. 
um, because, um, no, there is something uh, on the other side, and it's a continuation of this life um, in a different form. And it's all about um, trying to provide support and caring and love for people, both here and on the other side. Definitely. And, of course, Einstein said that we're... You know, we don't, we can't create or destroy energy. Energy just is, but it changes form like a, an ice cube in a glass of water. It changes form, and, and what we do is when our physical body dies, obviously we, we, we change form, and our energy becomes lighter, our vibration becomes faster, because we don't have this heavy body to carry around with us. Um, and this is just like my understanding based on the research that I've done. Um, and yes, that's very true. Yeah. yeah, Steve has more questions for us there. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, we have a, a, well, we have a comment first uh, in from Gwyn. Gwyn says, the brain is a recorder. Everything that's done in your life is recorded from zero to the end. But who or what reviews this information is still unknown. He says, electricity and energy survives, but where it goes is also unknown. Any comments? Well, you know... Uh most of my comments come from the thousands of people that I have talked to that have NDEs. Certainly, um, I agree with the whole concept that we're all energy, um, but we uh, the work that's going on now in consciousness is looking at people who have technically died and had an NDE outside of a living body. So they know that the energy can live outside of the brain. And that's a whole new body of work that's being researched. And we don't have a lot of answers for that yet. But hopefully one day we will be able to have a clearer picture of that. But I believe that our energy does go to the other side. And and we do a lot of things on the other side um, to continue our work in in this world and that world okay good answer um just before we, we continue on just going to say if anyone's listening if you want to text in a question for diane corcoran our guest this evening the number is zero eight seven four zero three four eight five four. a question in from dougie as well uh, is astral travel like an nde i.e going to different dimensions um, astral travel or out-of-body exper- experiences are one of the characteristics of an NDE. But you can also learn to do that through meditation, through different kinds of work. So um, it's not solely part of the NDE. Um, you can do that um, in a lot of different ways. But, yes, it is one of the characteristics of the NDE. I've actually heard as well that... Uh so if if people were to learn how to astral travel that there are a lot of dangers involved and that sometimes if the body if the soul can travel too far away from the body it's like the tether is broken and you can't come back and what happens to the soul at that point does it does it continue on to the other side as as an well obviously it wouldn't be an nde if they can't come back yeah (laughs) well we don't know what happens if they go to the other side um if they can't come back they can't tell us but um, I uh, I know of several people that practice having out-of-body experiences or have been able to do them their whole, whole life. As children, they were able to do them. Um, I've never heard of anyone who uh, talks about a broken tether, but, of course, if that happened, we wouldn't know about it necessarily. So, um, But not something I've heard about uh, in the people who teach it either. Um, I think there are safeguards uh, at looking at that. Okay. And just in relation to astral travel, Diane, is that something that you've ever experienced or, or done yourself? No, I haven't. I would love to. Um, one of these days when I get um, not to be so busy, I intend actually to take a course. The Monroe Institute um, offers a course in teaching people how to have astral travel or out-of-body experiences and i would very much like to do that okay well uh, if you ever do uh, please let us know because i'm sure we'd love to have you back on to to uh, have a, a review on uh, well, on astral travel 
I absolutely will. You want to talk about the bloom? Did you talk about that? Um, no, I haven't mentioned that. Um, Graham actually sent in a comment earlier, which I just I, I was kind of waiting for the right time to mention it, but I, we didn't seem to have the right time. But he says in cancer wards in hospitals, people near nearing death often have a resurgence for a day or so to sort out their affairs. It's called the bloom. It's a known phenomenon, he says. Is that anything you are aware of or know about, Diane? Well, we do see a lot of patients, cancer patients, who um, have at the end wake up and talk about seeing somebody else and somebody there to greet them. Um, they, many cancer patients will wait, and um, if they have something that they've got to work through, I, I absolutely believe cancer patients um, kind of define their own time when they're dying sometimes. Maybe it's a reconciliation for people or, you know, that something needs to happen that hadn't happened yet. Uh, so um, I've not ever heard the term the bloom. Um, so that's interesting, but sh- surely it does happen. I'm sure it does. And have you come across, you just said about timing there, um, about debt and stuff like that. Um, do you think that there is a higher power or higher energy controlling that time because some people even people that are under um uh, uh, in a coma or something like that um there's a particular time where they wait to pass over for whatever reason um have you come across anything like that well i think over the years and and clearly my experience in vietnam um brought this subject up and i absolutely believe that um, there is some higher power that makes some of these decisions, not us, because so often we would see people who weren't injured that bad and they should have lived, but they didn't. Or patients who were severely uh, hurt and uh, did live. And I think uh, same with cancer patients. Um You know, we've seen some that are miracles, that absolutely get better, all their tumors go away. There's a book by Anita Morjani called Dying to Be Me that is a fabulous book about a woman who was full of cancer. And in her last moments of breathing, um, she had an NDE and was told that her cancer would go away and her work was to go out and spread the word. And she's doing that. Her cancer went away and all that can be proven by x-rays. So it's, um, you know, there are things out there that uh, we can look at and see how that works. I was just going to say that. Is there anybody you come across in particular that were told during their NDE that they had to go and they had a particular task to do before their life finished you know, they have, apart from spreading the word, but if they had to, a particular role or job or some task that they were told they had to do. Well, there are people like that. PMH Atwater um, had more than one experience, and she's a very prolific writer. And she was told she had to write seven books. And she has finished those seven books now and now is writing for herself. But she spent her whole life writing these books. Um and, of course, there are, most of them are on NDEs. Uh, she has some of the best work on after effects because there are legitimate after effects that happen to people which make it very difficult because their family is going to expect the same person to come back. And they aren't the same person. They're going to have very different ideas about things, and they're just going to be a different person. And sometimes... That doesn't work if you have a wife who was big into cars and houses and money and you come back and want to write poetry. I'm not going to work very well. That, so Yeah, that, that must split up relationships as well for the simple reason if if they come back a completely different person and it must be kind of, especially if your husband or wife comes back and they're completely different and then, you know, that must cause problems. Yeah, it certainly does. And I mean, you know, we sometimes have to talk to the husband or wife and try to get them to understand that this is not anything they have or are consciously changing. 
Um, this is part of the NDE, and this is the way it happens. So sometimes the, there's a higher incidence of uh, divorce because they're just on very different um, tracks, so to speak, once uh, they have their NDE. Yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. You have another um, question there for yes. Diane, Steve? I do indeed. Uh, this is a question, another question from Graham. Uh, Graham wonders, Diane, uh, are you aware that at the time of death, all bodies lose 7 grams in weight, irrespective of body mass? When the person, person having an NDE returns to the body, does the 7 grams mass return too? He said he thinks it's this, it may be the soul leaving. I've never heard of that. Well, actually, I think the Swedes did some work in that, in measuring bodies when they uh, died and mm. then shortly after and yes, I have read some things about that, but an interesting question. Um, certainly, it's never been studied, but a very interesting question. Yeah, so I, w- I wonder then <laughs> a bit of comedy here, but I wonder like if that, if you were, if you wanted to go on a diet, I just had a a, a, a load of NDEs. And <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I I'd, think that's uh, harder than maybe going on a low carb diet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be. I've heard that too about um, the body being weighed before and after the person moves on, and does it actually a definitely a, a, a weight difference after they die? They're then you know that little bit lighter, and I've I've actually come across that. And um, the question I have for you is, if people have had an NDE and they're actually can see themselves you know say it's the operating theatre or something like that they're in a car accident and they see themselves is there anything that they get they got shocked by or surprised by or wanted to change after seeing themselves and seeing the situation well I think it's hard because they're trying to sort out am I alive am I dead that's my physical body down there but I'm up here in the ceiling. So it is very confusing initially, and then they learn that they can just swoop out and go anywhere. Um, And so uh, I don't know that it's a time for learning because it's just too new, Um, but it certainly is a time to try to sort things out for themselves. Yeah, because, I mean, there seems to be a mixed bag of experience there between... You know, for the people who are seeing themselves, say, in operating theatre, and other people seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and then other people seeing other things, it's definitely kind of a mixed bag of experiences that people have had. Um, and it's just interesting, or meeting relatives, or meeting spirit guides, and nobody, I suppose, knows for sure until it happens to you exactly what you're, what to expect. Yeah, that's true. We can only go on what, you know, all these other people have learned from the near-death experience, and that certainly gives me pause. Uh, And now when I lecture in a a nursing home, they're not interested in, you know, necessarily their life review. They are interested in what's it going to be like to die. Yeah. And so I think, you know, we've learned a great deal about that and can be very reassuring to people about that. Well, like like I said earlier about my grandmother getting up in the bed and waving to somebody at the end of it. Um, it's also been said, and I don't know how true this is, but it's also been said that uh, elderly people in old folks' homes, when you see them actually talking to themselves, people just think, oh, they're a bit mad talking to themselves. But it's been said that these people actually speaking to their guides or maybe speaking to a family mem- member, getting ready for the transition to move over. Yes, I think that's very true, and a lot of times they are confused um, or being accused of being confused and just written off that they're, you know, out of out of the loop, and that's not necessarily true. And unless you really sit and talk to them and, and really get to understand and know them, um, you might see it differently. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, there's so much out there that we don't understand and we're learning and science is kind of playing catch up, but science is beginning to agree with a lot of information that's now coming out, especially when it's been proven. You know, there's obviously different ways that it can be proven, but especially kind of the spiritual realm, I think people and science are beginning to realize that it's not just the case that when you die, that's it. You go on the 
go on the ground or you get burnt and, and uh, that's the the end of it. There's a lot more to it. And, you know, when you have people like Einstein c- turning around and saying the same thing, I mean, that has had some kind of uh, credence to it. But it's it's just amazing that um, the experience that people have. Is there anything that you've come across that we haven't actually mentioned? No, I think the the aspect of after effects is really important. There's um, physicists now um, who are studying this and looking at, and he's actually a, a classically trained physicist from Harvard and looking at trying to develop a theory um, to put all of this um, in. He's known since he was a child that there was something more than what people are saying. I think the near-death experience is a gift. For all of us to look at and um, I am particularly interested in two groups of people in children and veterans because the veterans don't have a safe place to land when they try to talk about NDEs um, they're immediately uh, thrown in with PTSD or bipolar or something else which is a shame because they're frequently um, given drugs. And children, if the parents don't believe them right away, they will close up and not talk about it. So if kids try to tell you about this imaginary friend, it might not be imaginary friend, it might be a spirit friend. And so um, you need to listen to them and ask them questions and journal for them uh, and try to help veterans. Um, I uh, have a uh, a link in um, my in the International Association for Neurodeath Studies just for veterans. We are trying to make a movie for them to, so they'll understand how it is important for them to own their own experience. Yeah, just on your your bio, uh, Diane, it does say here that you have served on many boards and you're currently on the board of the Purple Heart Homes, which is an organization an organization that provides housing and other solution for disabled veterans. Can you just tell us quickly uh, uh, what that is? Yes, I'm I'm not currently on the board, uh, board, but it is an organization in uh, North Carolina that looks for housing solutions for veterans, either building them or helping them rehab their home, and actually does other kinds of things in helping them adjust to life in terms of their finances, getting their uh, acts together um, with children. I mean, most of these veterans are severely compromised and have more than one issue they have to deal with. So they do a wonderful job of trying to um, support people and give them guidance and help. And just uh, very quickly, is it as bad as we, we see it portrayed in some of the movies out there with the veterans when they come back and they have the PTSD and they, they've, they've done a couple of tours of duty and they do come back. And it says that, that a lot of them, if, we, if we're to believe what we see, and uh, it, it, obviously you can tell us if it's true or if it's not true, that they do end up homeless on the streets and in very bad places. And the government, even though they've served their time and they have stood up for their country, that they are left kind of to wither and die. Well, we're um, hoping there are these veterans, many of them have served four or five uh, tours of duty, which personally I think is is unconscionable. Um, And they are messed up both physically and emotionally. And then if they have an NDE on top of that, um, you know, then people are going to try to tell them they're crazy. Um, some, many are homeless. We have a lot that are homeless and a lot that need support and other solutions. Um, our Veterans Administration is had numerous problems, and um, I think they're trying to resolve some of them, but it's such a big system that it's going to take um, a lot of smart people and, I think, thinking out of the box to be able to help these veterans and it may mean that they have to go into the civilian um, section to get help because there simply isn't enough help in the VA. Yeah, it also says that um, you're you're available to speak on certain topics as well and one of them is uh, gr- grief and bereavement. But before grief and bereavement, uh, we spoke just a little earlier about uh, working in, in geriatric 
uh, institutions. Yeah. Now, I actually worked in one for 15 years, and I did kind of speak to a lot of the people in there who were afraid of dying because like they knew they had lived a life and they, they tried to live good lives. And um, some of them were, were afraid of, of dying, and they expressed that to me when I was working there. And again, this this is it's 10, 10, 10 plus years ago. I didn't have any answers for them. But when you're preparing someone who's preparing to meet their their maker, how how do you prepare them? I mean, what what do you say to them? Well, a lot of times I get them things to read or read to them about NDEs and about what it's going to be like, and um, try to help them answer any questions, but try to encourage them. Uh, to know that somebody will be there, and this is what we've heard from thousands of people. So um, it really does help to have the background of the NDE and get some written material. There are hundreds and hundreds on our web page um, at IANS.org. Uh, um, we have many, many experiences and many articles and lots of information um, just as the YouTube has numerous talks, a um, couple that I've done uh, and other people have done, and I would show them this and, and, you know, to what degree they're capable of looking at stuff. Um, and uh, I, in fact, I got a email from a young man in Germany today who's an experiencer and just wants to know who we can talk to and we have groups in the United States all over the country that they can go and get support and talk to people. Um, there are a few groups in Europe. We don't have one in Ireland, but we have a couple in Germany and France and Belgium. Um, and we'd love to see somebody who'd like to start a group in Ireland. And what they do is just get together and talk about what it's going to be like, what their experience was, if they need support, that kind of thing. I think that would be a fantastic idea because a lot of times over here, um, realistically, in, in because Ireland's a predominantly Roman Catholic country, when people are nearing the end, the only person that would kind of go in to see them would be the, the local priest. And, you know, obviously the, the priest is going to be just approaching the subject from, well, from his angle, from the, the Roman Catholic uh, angle, I suppose, um, which a lot of people over the years in Ireland have kind of strayed from the church and people are not really they're not really you know religious per se so and you know when the priest comes in and he's talking about heaven and hell a lot of people just kind of see it as a lot of bunkum but I suppose on your deathbed you will kind of cling on to anything and I think in that situation it's better if people were to have accurate information especially yeah. from NDEs as opposed to just listening to what the priest has to say yes I recently had a priest call me actually and he had had an NDE, and he was really perplexed. He said, what am I going to do? I saw what it's going to be like. It's simple. You love people. You care for people. You forgive people. He said, that's not the years of training I've had about fear and hell and all this other stuff. He said, I have no idea what I'm going to do now, because he really was afraid he wouldn't be able to teach the you know the Catholic view. Yeah, and uh, well, do, do you know like after he had this NDE, did he continue on the road that he was on, or did he make adjustments? And uh, uh, he made adjustments, and and I think he actually left the priesthood. I mean, he was still counseling people and working with people, but he didn't feel like he could stay a priest and preach things that he didn't believe anymore. That's that's very interesting. Um, we have a question from Wonder Woman on the chat room. Uh, Wonder Woman says, have any people come back addressing the current political system and whether or not we survive, we, we obviously survived this, this world? Oh, my God, the political system. Um, I'm embarrassed to even talk about our political system right now. Um, because what we have going on, by the way, I think the business about Hillary's health is more fantasy than truth. Um, is it? So, yeah, I think so. If you just looked at her schedule, um, I have no idea how she keeps up with the demanding schedule that's been going on for a year. Um, a well, we, it, we, we do, Diane. It's called clones, but that's another subject. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm, we haven't had anybody come back and talk about it. We have people that come from other countries and talk about it and ask if, if we've totally lost our mind with Donald Trump. Um, but, uh, it is terrible, terrible to look at what's going on. It, it's be, it'd be strange to have somebody come back from an NDE and actually, I mean, I know they changed their lives and everything else, um, but to come back with some pertinent information regarding, you know, the political system or the financial system, plus the fact that I've come across and experienced this where a spirit, somebody that has moved over to the spirit world, didn't actually realize they were over there. They were st- still thought they were in the physical plane. Uh-huh. Which is well, it? Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, and that could happen. I think it'd be very interesting. We do have people who have prophetic visions and do, um, sometimes talk about what's going to happen in the world and sometimes physical things like tornadoes or, you know, the, some of the twin towers going down and some of these things. I haven't personally, I'm not, wouldn't be surprised to hear about it. But haven't uh, heard anything recently about our financial system or political system um, and what that's going to be about. Uh, I can tell you that most people who come back would certainly not approve of the behavior of um, our politicians right now with the meanness and racism and those kinds of things that would just simply not um, be something that most spiritual people can approve of okay has anybody ever come back from the NDE and found out information that they didn't know about somebody in their life that changed their perception Um, we've had a lot of people um, children who um, found out information about their relatives that the parents never knew about. So it was more of a um, being able to view this and know that it was the truth after they did some research. Um, I'm sure there are some, I have heard of some experiences where people were uh, severely abused or attempted murder or those kinds of things, and came back with a very different view and um, and sometimes information that might have led people to uh, correcting the victim or the tragedy that happened. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's great information if it, somebody comes back and tells you something like that. Um, especially if you're into kind of ancestry of your your relatives, and they come back and tell you something that you didn't know. Uh, especially if they were they did something in history or they were popular. Now the other thing that we've come across, and I know this is more spiritual, but um, we've been told, and from a spiritual point of view, that they could only go back about three generations, and after that they can't go back any further. So. Have you come across an NDE where they've met relatives, but only to a certain level of generation? Um, I have not. Um, I have not heard that there's any limitations, but I haven't personally talked to anybody who had many generations of information. But it's a very interesting question, and I actually will put it in our newsletter and ask if, uh, we know anybody like that. Yeah, I'm, it might be an idea. We just actually had a, a comment in as well from Paddy on the People's Internet Radio chat. And Paddy says, just in relation to NDEs, my father had an NDE when he was 13 years old, uh, back in 1929, when he got polio. He was told to go back that he had a long life to live. And uh, Paddy says he lived to the ripe old age of 87 years of age. So, uh hmm. A nice comment there, Paddy. Thanks for that. Excellent. Well, listen, we've reached that time in the evening, and um, that's fantastic information, Diane, mm. that uh, we talked about this evening with NDEs. We hope that our listeners enjoyed that and put uh, puts people's mind at rest to know that a lot of these people are, have, that have experienced, mostly by the sound of things, a good experience with an NDE, um, and very few bad experiences, which is you know, which is a good sign. Yeah. Um, do you want to give us 
your um, uh, all your details. Well, actually, I'm going to pass you up to Steve. But what I want you to do first, Steve's going to get all your details. But I do want you to just mention again that you're looking for a group over in Ireland here, either a group that has been set up or somebody to set up a group. And if you just want to talk about that again. Yes, we uh, we have stuff on the web for people who want to start groups. And you also could call the office. Uh, Susan is in the office and is the group leaders and would help anybody uh, that want, would want to start a group. And our IANDS uh, email is iands.org. And anybody who wanted to ask me a personal question, you can certainly also send it to the organization and they will send it on to me. So we would love to see a group started in Ireland. And um, when we can, we have group leaders, uh, or if one of us is traveling, we try to come over and visit these different groups. That'd be so, yeah. yeah. Uh, let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Brilliant. And if anybody wants to start a group, um, if they want to contact us, we'll put you in detail uh, in, in contact with uh, Diane. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in starting a group, because I think that's something that would be definitely needed over here in Ireland. Um, it would be good to see and moving forward, and it'd probably help an awful lot of people who are concerned about it, so it'd be a good idea. But Diane, again, thanks for coming on the show. I'm going to pass you over to Steve. Steve's going to get all your contact details um, okay. and where people can find you. Okay, yeah, echo, uh, I want to echo those sentiments, uh, Diane, as well. A lot of people on the chat room saying they really enjoyed the interview and uh, pass on our best wishes. There's a, a lot of people saying that, so again, uh, fantastic. Um, you, you have given us the website, the IA, IANDS.org. That's the International Association for Near Death Studies. Um, is there any other links you want to throw out there? Maybe YouTube or anything? Um, well, the YouTube, you just, uh, IANDS has its own channel. Uh, so you just search for near death experiences. Um, and the phone number is 919-383-7940. For the headquarters is here in Durham, and they can get you in touch with me if you want, and uh, we'll be happy to entertain and help anybody. A group consists of five people, or sometimes they have really big groups, so it can be small and still be very helpful. And if people will just talk about NDEs and start talking about it, you'll be surprised the number of relatives and work people that you have that have also had this experience but never talked about it. Okay, thanks for that, Diane. And again, in relation to the Astral Travel Course, if you ever do the Astral Travel Course, do drop us an email or give us a shout, and we'd love to have you back on to chat about that. Okay, Br- like idea. Okay, Diane, just stay with us there for a minute. We're just going to go off to a musical break, and we'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com, and People'sInternetRadio.com. Okay, we're back. A little bit of uh, heaven there. Feels like heaven fiction factory. Uh, great information there from Diane Corcoran. Again, the IANDS.org is the website if you want to contact Diane. And our phone number again, 919. Again, this is a, U- a USA number, 919-383-7940. Brilliant stuff, Steve. Right, our second guest is Stephen Manning from Integrity Ireland. Stephen has been on the show before, and he's at the cutting edge with his team in Integrity Ireland uh, uh, regarding challenging the system and how the system works over in Ireland and the corruption that's going on. And today there was a protest outside Judge Seamus Hughes's house, and this chap put two artic- uh, articulated uh, lorries back to back in front of his house to obviously stop. Uh, or hide from the protesters so we've asked Stephen to come on to give us an update to let us know how the protest went on and why Stephen Hughes is um, doing what he's doing or he did what he did good evening Stephen how are you doing? Oh, good evening Alan nice to hear you from, from hearing you again cheers thanks a lot for coming on Stephen I know you were down with the team today um, and doing a protest with uh, Seamus Hughes and you know one of the things uh, I made a comment on Facebook today and I said that you know that should be done to, that should be done to all the judges and maybe members of the Gardaí who are just you know um, um, corrupt and just not following the law as you know we're trying to follow the law as best we can and we do our best to do that and we know that we're penalised if we don't follow the law and there can't be one rule for us and another rule for them which seems to be do you want to tell us a bit about what happened and what led up to the protest today 
Yes, fine, uh, fine, Alan. Well, first of all, um, it should be clarified that um, the the organisation that I um, I'm sort of uh, administering is called Integrity Ireland, and from the get go, we were advocating that people would get together in local groups for the purposes of supporting each other, mainly when dealing with the courts, so that they would have um, people going in taking notes uh, because we've you know we have so much evidence of so much corruption, and as you just said a few minutes ago, that the system is supposed to be equally applicable to everyone, but we found out, basically speaking, and in a, a general way, basically anybody who works for the state, and certainly anybody who is connected or in senior positions of authority in the state, it seems that the laws don't apply to them. So to give credit where it's due, um, this uh, protest was actually initiated today by a group that is calling themselves the Anti-Corruption Task Force, or ACT. And they are emphasizing that uh, their mandate, if you like, or that their uh, philosophy is to take direct action. Now, it is something that Integrity Ireland advocates, but for, for practical reasons, we, we can't rule this sort of idea out nationwide with any uh, realistic uh, prospect of success until local groups such as this ACT group, which contains some members of Integrity Ireland and some other people who wouldn't per se be members of Integrity Ireland, but they've decided enough is enough, they have to do something. So just to give credit there, Alan, uh, and then I'll tell you now what happened today. Well, basically, uh, the, the local newspaper, the Mayo News, had picked up on the fact that the ACT task force uh, had declared that they were going to launch a protest at the home of this local judge, Seamus Hughes. And they were doing this after being utterly frustrated in their attempts to draw uh, the attention of the respective authorities to what uh, judges like Seamus Hughes have been doing. And then we're, we're talking about now unlawful acts, unconstitutional acts, and in some cases, criminal acts. And there's nobody in authority will respond to us. So as a desperate last uh, gasp attempt to draw media attention and public attention to what's going on, they decided that uh, Seamus Hughes' work was going to, quote, literally, follow him home. And so what happened today was the, the, we announced that, or, or the ACT announced, and uh, Integrity Ireland took up the statement and promoted it across. So we, we'd have a, a big following now on, on social media. And we let people know about this. And uh, a number of people turned up today, and we, we discovered as soon as we arrived in location, and you have to understand that um, Judge Hughes' house faces onto a main road. Literally, there's only a footpath outside the front of his house, and then you're on the main road coming in from Newport, um, literally about 25 yards from a major traffic junction, a bridge, a river, traffic lights, um, and all the rest of it. So we arrived there to find that two articulated containers had been parked right outside the front of his house in such a way that if any demonstrators or protesters were to stand in front of his house, they would not be seen from the main road. But in the same vein, what it, what it did was block uh, traffic coming down the main road because there's only two lanes of traffic there, one each way. So all the traffic coming into Newport, uh, sorry, coming into Westport from the Newport direction was forced out into the middle of the road to pass these two containers, which I might add had no registration numbers on them and were parked illegally on double yellow lines as well as one of the uh, no entry boxes, you know, the yellow boxes, because there was also a junction literally facing straight into the side of the trailers as well, coming out from um, a local business park. So there was the potential for chaos, um, you know, traffic chaos there today, which, is, which was caused by the decision by the authorities to park these two articulated trailers outside the house of a judge in order to, I suppose they expected, to disrupt the, uh, the legitimate protest and the legitimate, as they call it, lawful assembly that went on outside. But in fact, it had the complete opposite um, effect because everybody's talking about it now. And tell us, um, I've seen a photo on Facebook and there uh, looked like there was a guard posted outside the house. Yes. And um, who, who's paying for that guard, by the way? I, it wouldn't be us, the taxpayer, by any chance, would it? Well, I, I don't think we're ever going to see the bill, but I think you can be assured that he wasn't there of his own free will. Now, I, I did go up. There, was, there, were, there were only two guards officially on duty. And I think the authorities, and when I talk about the authorities here, I, I, I use the term loosely. Usually, I'm speaking about rogue authorities. 
uh, people in senior positions of authority and power who are uh, abusing the resources of the state to look after their own interests and the interests of the connected elites. Um, and, and we don't have to go down that, that track too far in order to, to qualify it. You know, everything from the banking scandals uh, to the special tax deals to the fact that ordinary people, as you said, are required to obey all the laws of the land. And if we step in a fraction outside of that law, we can expect uh, to be dumped upon, you know, from a great height. Yeah. But these people can do what they like. No, but the, the guards, I'll just say this, Alan, um, I, I went up to the two guards over there. There was just one guard standing on the doorstep of um, uh, Seamus Hughes' house, Judge Hughes' house, uh, a bit like at 10 Downing Street, like they have there, you know. And then there was another guard that we've all become very familiar with because uh, he's regularly in the courts with a camera um, taking um, uh, video of all the, the, the people who may be protesting or even just standing up and um, challenging some of the illegal activities in the courts. But there was quite a substantial presence of, of police cars coming around and around in circles, you know. Um, but I think they, they realized that the best thing they could do under the circumstances was not draw too much attention to it. But on the other hand, why on earth would they then put two articulated uh, trailers out, right out in the middle of the road, um, uh, which has now become the talking point uh, of Westport? So, okay, so we have two Gardaí assigned, obviously paid by the taxpayer, to Seamus Hughes' house. He had two yeah. articulated uh, trucks with no registration on double yellow lines. Yes. And which is causing traffic chaos down there. And a potential accident as well could be caused by this. And the guards do nothing. Nothing well, uh, at all. Well, actually, Alan, and again, I, you know, we're making a bit of a... a well, it, the facts are that if you or I or anybody else were to park an articulated trailer... At a, at a T-junction, across the, the front of a T-junction, on double yellow lines where there's an, an open yellow mark box. I mean, of course, it's, it's a serious traffic offence, at the very least. Now, um, some, some members of the public, and I don't mean now necessarily people that were there for the protest, but some people who spoke to some of the demonstrators there. Now, you must understand, the demonstrators were handing out leaflets that had been drawn up. I have one of them here with me. They were drawn up by um, ACT and um, Ballina ACT, and the, their, their leaders are based up in Ballina, but they're getting quite a lot of attention around the country for what they're doing. But they, they list 10 points on a small flyer. Now, the, I, as I understand it, there were several thousand of these flyers printed up, and apparently they were all handed out because these, um, the demonstrators stood in the road, and as the, the traffic went by slowly, which it had to because of the obstructions and everything, they were doing their best to hand out leaflets, and there were a few posters as well available. No doubt these will become visible on Facebook and, and social media quite soon. We're just a bit, we didn't get back to late tonight, so we, d we haven't had time to put them up yet ourselves. But um, they basically outline 10 reasonably solid reasons uh, for why uh, Judge Seamus Hughes, uh, who unfortunately is not an exception to the rule, um, why Judge Seamus Hughes uh, should step down or be replaced or be, shot, be fi uh, fired or sacked, or whatever it might be. Um, but I, I don't know how aware the, the listeners are um, as to the situation in the courts at the moment, Alan. But we have been told uh, in le by letters, now from the Minister from, for Justice right through to the Chief Justice, uh, to Tishikenda Kenny, and then there are other authority figures who are point-blank refusing to answer our questions. But they have told us, the ones that have spoken to us, the ones who have responded have told us, that there is no facility to complain about the conduct of district court judges. Now, I'd like to make this absolutely clear and unequivocal. They are lying to us. And we've pointed this out to them, and we've sent them back their own legislation and said, here's what you're supposed to do. Why won't you do it? And then we just get hit with a wall of silence. And their only technique and tactic at the moment is to hope that we'll just all get worn out and shut up and go away, which is why people uh, such as the ACT, the Anti-Corruption Task Force, um, um, I believe it's absolutely necessary now that we have to bring, bring these issues. When I say to the doorsteps, of course we don't want to be accused of harassing people. We don't want to be accused of upsetting their families and so on and so forth. But in context of the damage that some of these errant judges are doing, not only to individuals, families and communities by their wayward actions, 
which do not fall under their mandate. And their mandate is to, to, they are independent of their statutory functions, but they are subject to the law and to the Constitution. Of course. And, yeah. and more so them than us because of the position they're in. Now, Absolutely. let's add another piece of, um, a piece to the jigsaw because you mentioned, uh, when I spoke to you today briefly, um, something about, we did the Doherty case last week. And yes. you, I believe you know something that might be another piece of the jigsaw linked to this. Well, first of all, I should say I haven't been in touch with the Doherty parents personally yet. And I'm as shocked and surprised, I suppose, at some of the revelations that I saw uh, um, by the, um, the, the, the Scots journalist there who, was, uh, who had an interview with you. And there was a piece put up on, on Facebook by some helpful person. And I, I was glad to see that he had noticed uh, that Integrity Ireland, as, a, as an organization, as a community, was trying to do something about the corruption in Ireland. But in, uh, specifically with the Doherty case, uh, there are three or four names that have sur- surfaced in the Doherty case. And by, uh, from what I can tell, and I don't know the whole story, Alan, so I, I'm, I'm loath to, you know, I'm reluctant to, to quote, um, you know, absolutes here. Yeah. But from what I've heard, the few things that I do know is that the, the Doherty family have been, the, the parents have been separated from their children. According to the guardian ad litem who's looking after the children, the children are models of uh, well-behaved children who love and respect each other and have obviously been well brought up. There have been assessments, psychological assessments done of the parents. Apparently, they've passed those uh, 100%. But for some reason, the Irish establishment and most notably certain judges and certain social workers within the institution of TUSLA, which is the Child Protection Services here in Ireland, some of these people who have also been involved in uh, difficulties with me and my family, which if you give me a second, I'll go into very briefly, Alan. But they're, they're, the same names are cropping up. And uh, I've never thought it was coincidence. I've always thought that there were systemic failures. Uh, but in the Irish Child Protection Services in particular, they seem to be populated at the top end with some, some people who are so obviously unsuited to that sort of work because of their aggressiveness, because of their arrogance, because of their willful ambition, and their, and their willingness to destroy families and take children away from families and put them into care. We, we later found out that there, there is a sort of a, a little sub-business going on here with foster families getting paid considerable amounts of money with solicitors being appointed from connected law firms you know, to represent the children and there's a different solicitor for each child and they're all, every time they go into court of course they're claiming fees and everything. So there's a little side industry in, which could be pointed at as a possible ulti- ulterior motive for agencies like Tulsa interfering in otherwise happily, happy families. And, and if I could just very briefly say it here, uh, Alan, um, in our own case, just, I'll just give you just one brief example. Uh, at a time where my wife and I were out of the house for literally for an hour and a half uh, at a hospital appointment, and my wife was doing some shopping, my two eldest daughters, uh, aged 10 and 12 at the time, um, were obliged to come home from school because the school had been hit by lightning. So they came in through the door as we were going out and I told them right uh, stay in the house girls we'll be back in a couple of hours uh, don't let anyone in and on that occasion two men dressed in black turned up at the door we now know that they were trying to provoke a reaction they were they were hoping I was still in the house and I was going to come out there were two guards parked nearby the long and the short of it was this was that they harassed and intimidated our children for about 45 minutes thankfully they didn't open the door to them one of the two guys we're talking about was a criminal, not just a criminal, but a relative of T.J. Enda Kenny. And when I say a criminal, I mean someone with a, a serious criminal record. And uh, when, I, when I later called the guards, immediately we came home. I got home as quick as I could. The girls were in bits. They were, they were scared. The guards had threatened to break into the house if they didn't open the door. And I called the chief superintendent asking him if I could, uh, if I could well, I asked his secretary, could I meet the super, superintendent, chief superintendent, and find out what was going on. Uh, the next thing we knew, a referral had been made to the Child Protection Services that the girls had told the guards that I had locked them in the house unsupervised for three days. Now, the problem with this, not only was it a lie and a, and a dirty, disgraceful and shocking lie, but it was clearly designed to visit the worst sort of harassment on an otherwise, an otherwise uh, healthy and, and, and uh, you know, uh, innocent family. It, it kicked off a process whereby 
the Child Protection Agency is then obliged to come and do a so-called robust investigation. And while they're doing the investigation, they are allowed by law to make applications to the court to have your children taken away. Well, to add to that, Stephen, because Brian Gerrish on UK Column um, did state, now I don't know whether it applies over here, but in the UK, apparently they get money for getting taking kids off families. That So there's, yes. an, there's an incentive there for them to take the kids off you. Well, it's not just that, Alan. Uh, and, and again, um, uh, the, the example I just gave you, for example, right? Um, there are certain law firms in Ireland who, if you like, uh, they, they get first dibs, if you like, at some of these uh, child protection cases. They're, they're connected into the system. Yeah. There's one law firm out in uh, Westport and Castle Bar, for example, that uh, it, it has four different names registered, and they're all very identical to each other. And this law firm is run by the son-in-law of a judge. That law firm gets, gets the pick of the HSE child protection cases. And in some cases, you have to wonder, is the judge, whose name is still on the law firm, is that judge making decisions to favor the interests of his son-in-law? It's, it's, um, it, it, it has to be asked. You know, but yeah, this is the sort yeah. of thing that goes on as, on as routine. And people in, don't believe this because until people like yourself come on the radio and say what's going on, people have this um, misplaced faith in the system, think they're going to get justice. And then we hear stories like yourself and other people like Joe and Colm and Wayne, and you think, there's no justice. And when we had Dave Scott on last week, he said, if anything ever happens like what happened to Doherty, uh, family, just pack up and go because there's no point going to child services or the authorities or the Gardaí because you're wasting your time. I, I absolutely agree with that. And Alan, I'll tell you, uh, there's there's one little caveat that has to be thrown in here. Um, I have, of course, I've had dealings now with with a lot of Gardaí, with a lot of court officials, with court service staff, uh, with solicitors and barristers, with social workers and so on and so forth. And it, it's, it's obviously, it's very important to point out that there are some decent, honourable people working in these um, institutions who are doing their absolute best in difficult circumstances to, to stay on the straight and narrow, so to speak. However, it's equally true to say that almost without exception, if people are rising through the, the, the ladder um, of uh, promotion, and they are moving, uh, you know, towards the top of their professions. You, you have to assume that they are either complicit in wrongdoing or that they are knowingly turn, turning a blind eye to it. And that seems to be a, an accurate general statement across the board. And again, of course, you can pick up one or two, but they are very rare exceptions. The rare judge, um, a rare court official, um, a rare senior guard, because I found most ranking guards, I... I I always assume that they're decent men and women. But as you start climbing up the ladder, you realize most of the guards, are, and again, I pass the rank of sergeant, it's a political appointment. It's not a point, you're not appointed on merit. You're certainly not appointed on the quality of the service you're giving the public. It's the quality, if you like, or the depth and the loyalty of your service to your superiors, That's no it. matter what they're up to. And yeah. Exactly, and it's, it's, it's identical to the corporate world. It works the same way. As you climb up, climb up the ladder, it works the same way. Well, listen, Stephen, thanks a lot for coming on. That's much appreciated. I'm sorry it's just a short interview, but it gives us an update on what you did today. Um, listen, thank all the team from myself and Steve um, for what you're doing, because I know you're at the cutting edge, and I know you're putting your neck on the line, Joe and Wayne and Colm, time and time again, to bring the system down, or at least show it for what it is, which is complete corruption and uh, cronyism at, uh, at its best. But uh, I'm going to pass you over to Steve. Steve's going to get all your details on where people can find you. And uh, thanks again for coming on, Steve. Thank yeah. you very much, Steve. Yeah, no problem. Uh, great information, Alan, as, or Stephen, sorry. <laughs> great information, Alan. Great. Are we off the now, Steve, are we? No, no, we're still on. Um, I just want to say, uh, if anyone, if anyone wants to find out more about Stephen Manning and Integrity Ireland, we do have the website here, and that is www.integrityireland.ie. Do you want to throw any other links there, like the Facebook uh, link as well, there, Stephen? Yes. Well, the front page of that website, if you scroll down, you'll see the Facebook link. We've also got videos uh, on on the main web page as well as Facebook. But I would like to throw something in really quickly, Stephen, for your listeners, because. It's very, very important. It's, it's coming up on Tuesday. Now, on Tuesday, myself and Colin Granahan are, are facing charges 
uh, of um, you know aggressive uh, insulting behavior in a in a in a public place because of an occasion where a judge ran out of his court. Now, very briefly, I just want to make this this point clear because it will be going up tomorrow. Gardy came to my house last week and instructed me verbally that I was required at that hearing. But I've had no paperwork, appropriate paperwork. Now, they've already had four hearings. I've refused to turn up at two of the hearings on the grounds that criminal activity is ongoing in the courts at the hands of the authorities, and I will not be complicit in it. However, I am turning up at the courthouse next Tuesday with my own security in order to protect me because I can't get one member of the Irish establishment to actually... Uh, uh, to confirm that I will not be assaulted in an Irish court as long as I am not doing unlawful anything unlawful. I can't get one person. So we will have a security cordon there. I'm going into the court for the purposes of laying prosecutions under the common, for common informal legislation against a raft of senior authority figures, including a couple of judges. So it's going to be an interesting day, and if there's anybody around Castlebar or in the vicinity who would like to come, we are meeting around 10 o'clock in front of the courthouse uh, for the for the purposes of moving this this project forwards, we're, we're basically backing the authorities into a corner, using their own legislation, their own rules and regulations, and it should be a very very interesting day. Brilliant. We'll have to get an update on that again. Maybe down the line we'll have to do a full show and do a catch up, Stephen. But again, thanks a lot for coming on, and good luck on Tuesday, and good luck to the team. Um, you know who's going to be there to support you. Just stay with us there for a minute, Stephen, and we're just going to go to a quick musical break. We'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com, and People'sInternetRadio.com. Okay, we're back. Uh, just play that song. Starship, nothing's going to stop us now for Stephen Manning and everyone in the team of Integrity Ireland. Let's hope nothing is going to stop them. And onward and upward for the team. Yeah, keep exposing, letting us know what's going on. If there's, if there's whistleblowers out there, get them to contact us. We'd be happy to disguise their voice or talk to them and interview them. Um, Obviously, we don't mean people who play tin whistles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, okay. Now, we said at the start of the show that we got in contact with a, an Irish website that's selling hemp juice with CBD in it, not THC, and they have a license to produce this, and it's um, they're the only couple in Ireland who have a license to do this, and they actually sell the hemp juice on their website, and you can buy different variations of it depending on what quantity you want. Now, the website address... Um, the couple are called Kate and Marcus, and the website address is www.healing-wit-hemp.com. So, wah 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 dot healing dash wit dash hemp dot com, and that's a dash, not an underscore. It's a dash, okay? Or a hyphen. A hyphen, even better. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, so if you go off to the website, you can have a look. They talk about CBD. They talk about the hemp juice. And it's food. It's not medicine. But people have taken it and they have balanced their endocannabinoids. Yes. That's it. Did I get that right? <laughs> it's one of them words. Um, so we're going to have... I was talking to Kate about it. And I just said, you know what? It'd be better if Kate and Marcus come on the show and tell us all about it, rather than us just telling you about it. So, not next week, but the week after, we have Kate and Marcus coming on the show, hopefully going to talk about it, and talk about what they do, and the benefits um, of taking the hemp juice. And as I said, myself and Steve have had a sample, and we've tried it, and, um, you know, it's, you know... It's, you know, me with my taste buds. <laughs> Steve is fine, but, you know. I spoke to Alan a couple of days ago after, after we, 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 we got the, the sample in. And I said to him, well, how did it go? <laughs> and he said, and I quote, I dissolved it in some orange juice. And I think he said, I nearly, <laughs> I nearly drank the whole carton yeah, of did, orange yeah. juice. <laughs> I had to keep diluting it because of the taste, you know. But look, oh, I know God. it's good for you. I know it's good for you. So, like, you know, so we did, we did try it. And uh, so thanks to Kate and Marcus for sending a sample. They didn't have to do it, but uh, very nice of them. And when we told them who we were, they were kind of, you know, we said, we're happy to advertise your website. And they, they were kind of suspicious. Of, well, how much is this going to cost? And we said, well, nothing is free because we think what you're doing is fantastic. So um, and then kind of went on from there. And then we sorted out the interview. So there you go. Now, 
So um, healing-with-hemp.com. Pop over there and check it out yourself and see what you think. Now, um, on next week's show, the plan is, whether it happens or not, I don't know, but the plan is that um, a couple of weeks ago, Thomas Williams, who was on our show, he did a very cutting edge show with people on it that were let's just say um high level people on the inside plus what we've been told an et person uh, was on the show so we've asked thomas to is it possible to get the same people on a show on oim next week so we can actually talk to them we can ask them questions as well because you know we did send the link out of thomas's show to a few people and said what do you think of this and obviously one or two people were sceptical and there's no no reason why they, they wouldn't be. Um, myself and Steve have gone down a number of rabbit holes in there in, in the past and found there's nothing down there. Um, so we asked Thomas um, if it's possible that we could organise for them to come on and just maybe answer a few questions that people have emailed us in about the show um, just to you know alleviate uh, their kind of, um, uh, not so much a concern, but... And on what they've heard, to uh, you know, to uh, for peace of mind, um, on what was said and what's going on. Um, so Thomas said he's going to do his best to try and get these people on. And if we can do that for ne- next week, that'd be brilliant. Because if we do have an ET person on the show, along with high-ranking people on the inside, then it's going to be one hell of a show. And Thomas is obviously going to be there as well to help out and to jump in and talk about you know certain things so that's going to be very interesting right okay next on the list is um we did send out an email to everyone on the supporters email mailing list if you have received the great stuff if you haven't received it email us and tell us i haven't received it and then we'll send you the email but it's gone out it's september the 24th at 3 p.m. The location was sent out on the email, so you know where you're going. If you haven't received it, let us know. Um, and the last thing on my list, Steve, I don't know about you. Last thing on my list, one of the things on our wish list was to change our audio interface because the one that we have here in the studio, the two ports are faulty, the phantom power doesn't work, and the headphone jack is knackered as well. That's the kind of equipment we're, we're kind of using. Um, but thanks to your donations. Um, we've actually finally got around to ordering a new audio interface which is coming in this week and we have a, a, a good guy that we know called Andrew who's going to be popping down to help us do a bit of audio checking and checking our system and making sure everything's kind of working okay and see if we can improve it a bit so that's on the cards for this week so again thanks for your donations much appreciated yeah just in relation to that um, it's amazing that when the energy is flowing in the right direction uh, and doors just keep opening. As as Alan just mentioned, there's a chap that we've recently come across, Andrew. Andrew is actually, his background is kind of sound engineering. And we actually kind of came across him completely by, uh, well, I have to say synchronicity. Obviously, it was obviously meant to happen. And uh, he's been very helpful to us and showing us what we're doing and how we're doing it wrong or, or how we're doing it right. So, yeah, uh, kudos to Andrew. Um, yeah, what else? There's not really too much on my list. Uh, the only thing that we I, I want to say is that um, as as kind of the Irish people, I don't know if it's the same for every every country, uh, but Irish people, we always kind of go around with this, ah, sure, if I win the lotto, or, or ah, sure, if this and if that. Um, well, from what we've been told and we uh, by a, a, a lady that we know, Paula, uh, we shouldn't be saying if, we should always be saying when. So when I win the lottery or when I do this or when I do that, um, she says it kind of puts it puts wheels, uh, you know, kind of spiritual wheels or karma wheels in motion, if you like. And instead of you know just kind of dismissing something, Ash, or if I win, if if is not going to happen. But if you, if you if you kind of think positive and say when, then it kind of puts the universe to your way of thinking, and allegedly things will come your way. So anyway, when we win the lottery, we're going to do some great things. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say. And, and that's the plan. <laughs> Just as I mentioned earlier, the mobile phone is only going to be available on the live show for texting in. It's going to be switched off, so don't text on the phone. If you do want to contact us, there's a plethora of communication channels that you can use. Phone, Facebook, email, uh, and uh, a number of other um, t- uh, ways to communicate with us. But email... Yeah, Twitter. 
Twitter, you yeah, know, email, email. <laughs> don't tweet, please don't tweet. No, don't tweet. Email would be the best way. That's the best way to contact us. Secondary, you can phone us and leave a message on the answer machine, um, and uh, we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. Um, that's well, that's that's what we try and do. Very busy down this end. Loads going on. Loads of people want to come on the show, which is fantastic. Um, we're just going to have to try and organise as much as much as we can. We also have a guest coming on. In two weeks' time, we're going to be talking to Paddy about the wind farms because here in Kells, they want to put up these monstrous, terrible, bloody um, wind wind farms, a whole rake of them, uh, one in Carlingstown and one in Kells. But they're going over, they're, going, uh, they're being, trying to be install them all around Ireland. And they're just ridiculous. And the cost of the property is coming down and the noise and everything else. So we've asked Paddy, who's a representative of a local group, to come on as well in two weeks' time to talk about the wind farms um, and let you, let people know. So if they are going to plan them, to plan to put them in your area in Ireland, get a group together and fight to not have them installed because there's a lot of issues with them. But we'll find that out in two weeks' time. For myself, we have to go. Do you know who's on with... Uh, is Finn not on tonight? I think he's not no, well. No. Good luck, Finn. I hope you feel a bit better later on. I don't know who's on with... Yeah, I'm not here. sure. I'm not sure who's to, who's going to be on at nine o'clock, but uh, yeah, Vin is unwell at this moment in time, seemingly. So uh, we're going to wish him all our best. Yeah. All right. So take care from yourself, Alan James. Take it easy. Stay safe. If you have any news, let us know. Bye bye. Okay. From myself, Stephen George. It's been a, it's been a, a blast, and uh, looking forward to next week's show. Uh, you never know what may happen. So we see you all again next week. Until then, take care. Bye bye. 